In case anybody's wondering, it's VBS week. I guess we got to learn to make goalpost signs or something probably uh, this week. So uh, this is the first time I've, I've preached with an audience behind me. But uh, they look pretty excited, so I'll, if, if you fall asleep on me, I'm going to turn around. <laughs> Good to have you here. We've got a busy week, and if you don't have much to do this week, see uh, Stacy or Cindy or Debbie, and I'm sure they'll find something for you to do that involves uh, ministry during BBS. Something. There's probably something to do. Um, and so we will enjoy sharing the good news. Well, we're back in the book of Philippians. Last Sunday was a little different. We had a memorial service and new members and, and uh, so on. And, and next Sunday will be BBS Sunday, so it's going to be, uh, again, a little bit different. But in between, we're trying to get through the book of Philippians and uh, we'll still be there in a few, few months from now, I almost guarantee it, just working our way through. But well, Philippians chapter 3, I think this is message number 22 in our Philippians series. So we've been doing this for a while, taking breaks for, for Advent and Lent and uh, Easter, and now we're back in. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to concentrate on verses 4 to 7 today, but to get the paragraph going from where we preached a couple weeks ago, we're going to start with verse 2. Let's stand together in honor of reading God's Word and for a prayer. Paul writes, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Lord, bless the word today. Honor it, we pray, with your presence. Speak to our hearts. Draw us close to you. You're such a good, good father. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that Old time religion, it's good enough for me. Okay. All right. Some of you don't know that one. That's a catchy tune found in even in some old hymn books, but its meaning is very sketchy. The phrase old time religion is subject to anyone's interpretation. Jesus and God are not mentioned anywhere in the song. I'm a person who likes to analyze some of the songs we sing. And from reading the passage I just read, I'm pretty certain that Paul would not sing that song. Because for Paul, the old time religion would have been Judaism. Right? That's the way he grew up. That was, that was in his background. And since his conversion to Christianity, he uh, left that behind. So the false teachers would come around singing, give me that old time religion. You new Christians, you have to go back to that old way of doing things. And Paul would have said, that's false teaching. We're moving forward with Jesus Christ. The definition of religion is very interesting. I uh, looked online, they have so many different interpretations, I actually had to get out a book called Webster's. And in my 1987 edition of Webster, that's when they used to publish books, you know, back then, uh, uh, it said that religion means a belief in supernatural power which governs the universe, recognition of God as an object of worship, practical piety, 
in any system of faith and worship. Any system of faith and worship. So some of those things, that after reading that, that definition of religion, you and I can have problems with equating the word Christianity with the word religion. Any system of faith. Well, Christianity says there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, and so on. So we can't equate the two. In fact, most religions don't even believe in Jesus. Many of them believe in many gods. It's really confusing to equate religion with Christianity. And so when we sing, give me that old time religion, we're singing that from a Christian perspective, saying, I want Christianity that's like the old kind when they, I guess, Paul and Silas, because that's one of the verses, but I mean, it, but it doesn't specify, so they could sing that in any other church and denomination and religious group and, and be confusing. And so when I was reading about religion online, I found out that there is no consensus about what actually it takes to make something into a religion. So you can have a religion of no God, which is the religion of atheism or agnosticism or something like that. I mean, it's all kind of weird stuff. Or you can have a religion where man is God. So I'm, the word religious is an interesting word. Uh, religion is undefined just about, but religious means you have a loyal devotion to you're faithfully devoted to something. So you can religiously be devoted to the Colts if you wanted to be. Or anybody following the Bruins and the Blues as they're battling it out for the Stanley Cup. One person, two people? All right. Now that is some religion. If you follow hockey here in Indiana. How many of you are following the basketball playoffs? Oh, all right. Now, that's Indiana's religion. All right. Anyway, I'm sharing all this in the beginning so that if anyone asks you if you are religious, your answer probably should be something like, I don't think of myself as being religious, although I am devoted, <laughs> but I think of myself as a Christian, right? Right? Because I believe in Jesus Christ, and I have a relationship with him. So probably you, you need to, because religious can be anything. And that's kind of my point in, in the introduction. Uh, in the context of today's passage, you will remember that we preached two weeks ago about Paul warning his Philippian readers about Jewish teachers who would come and begin to teach that in order to be a follower of God, these new Christians would also need to follow the Old Testament laws and the Jewish traditions. And so Paul wrote in verse 2, beware, three times. And we really got into that, what those words meant, the dogs and the evil workers and the mutilation. And uh, he said, beware, beware, beware. They, they were false teachers and they were not to be listened to, nor was their advice to be followed. And the Christian salvation is only to be found, in verse 3, with a relationship with Christ Jesus. So we nailed that down pretty strongly a couple of weeks ago. Paul is building off that argument in today's verses as we get to 4 through 7. He is saying if the false teachers claim that keeping the Old Testament laws and the Jewish traditions are the way to go, if they're putting their confidence in the flesh, then Paul said he was more devoted to that old Judaism than any of them were, even these Jewish teachers. Paul had jumped through all the Jewish religious hoops, but none of it satisfied his soul. And then Jesus entered his life, and Paul was finally spiritually satisfied. So Paul does not use the word religion in this passage, but he is definitely drawing a contrast between the old religion, his old-time religion, and a, as a former religion, and his new experience, his new relationship, his own ongoing fellowship with Jesus Christ. So he's drawing this comparison here, and it goes on through the chapter, and we're just kind of hitting the first part of it. So let's look at this contrast. 
uh, well, it will be an ongoing contrast. But let's look at the first area. First thing that Paul is talking about is his religious heritage. In verses 3 and 4, he wrote about confidence in the flesh. People have confidence in the flesh. He said Christians should not have confidence in the flesh in verse 3. That's not something that they do. Salvation did not come through circumcision or keeping the church traditions or any other thing religious people do. Salvation came through Jesus Christ. And we nailed that pretty strongly a couple of weeks ago. But in verse 4, Paul said that if salvation was about having confidence in your flesh and the things that you do, then Paul was the most likely candidate of getting that kind of religion because he had done everything that a strict Jewish person could do to be devoted to Judaism and its belief. And that's when Paul listed seven items that showed he was the most religious of Jews. The first four items had to do with his Jewish heritage. And we want to talk about those. Number one, verse five, Paul was circumcised the eighth day. Now, this proved that Paul was born a Jew. His parents followed the Abrahamic covenant established in Genesis 17, verse 12, with Abraham. And uh, it said that circumcision was to take place on all newborn Jews on the day, eighth day of their life. And there was a presentation. It even happened to Jesus. He was presented in the temple. and They went through this, this process. It was something that was done. Um, and so this was different than the Arab nations because they, as descendants of Ishmael, Because Ishmael was circumcised at the age of 13, because that's how old he was at that time. And so they used it as a rite of passage from boyhood to adulthood. And uh, so Paul said, eighth day, I was a Jew from the moment I was born. Paul was of the stock of Israel. This was an important phrase for the Jews, because Ishmaelites could claim ancestry back to Abraham. Edomites could claim ancestry to both Abraham and Isaac. But Israelites were the only ones who could claim Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel when he wrestled uh, with the Lord. They were, only, they were the only ones, the Israelites were the only ones who could claim ancestry to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the Israelites. Jacob's name changed to Israel. So that weeded out the other ancestors of Abraham. Now Paul was also of the tribe of Benjamin. In Paul's day, being of the tribe of Benjamin brought certain bragging rights amongst the Jewish people, more so than any other tribe except Judah. Now Paul was part of the, this very elite tribe in Judaism. Benjamin was the only son of Jacob, Israel, who was born in the promised land. Benjamin was the only one born there that gave them some bragging rights. The first king of Israel, Saul, came from the tribe of Benjamin. And no doubt Paul, formerly known as Saul, his namesake was probably King Saul. That's probably who he was named after. Probably a very popular name to the Benjamin uh, tribe. When the ten tribes split off from Judah following King Solomon, when Rehoboam and Jeroboam split the kingdom, guess who stayed with Judah? Benjamin. Benjamin and Judah were the two loyal tribes who stayed with the Davidic dynasty, whereas the other ten went off in rebellion. So that also showed the faithfulness of Benjamin and gave them bragging rights. And after the exile, they had different exiles, but after they came back and started to establish the the kingdom of of, uh, Israel again, It was Judah and Benjamin who made up the nucleus of those that came back and restored the country under Nehemiah and Ezra and all those guys. They formed the nucleus of the newborn, of the reborn nation of Israel. Another one that kind of gave Benjamin some bragging rights is the story of Esther, because every year since then they have the Feast of Purim. And Purim was the, the thing uh, celebrating 
Esther and the decree from the Persian governor and, and uh, all that went on there to free the people and allow them not to be killed. And uh, one of the key players next to Esther in that story is Mordecai, and he was from Benjamin. All of these things beginning to factor in makes Benjamin a very elite, aristocratic tribe that Paul was very proud of in his Jewish heritage. It's kind of like saying that I could trace my ancestry back to the first pilgrims on the Mayflower or Christopher Columbus or something, you know, discovered for America. Our history is just a couple, 300, I don't know, uh, as a nation, not very long in comparison to some of these histories uh, that they could have claimed. But he had an impressive national pedigree when he could say, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And then he said he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And your first inclination in reading this is that, well, of all the Jewish people, that he was more Jewish than anyone else, and, or he was born of Hebrew parents. Uh, but there's a deeper meaning. Remember that uh, because of the dispersion of the Jews under various exiles, many of them did not return when the exiles were over. In fact, many of the major cities of Paul's time included Jewish people and Jewish even synagogues. And sometimes when Paul would go to one of these uh, missionary journeys, he'd stop in a city uh, and he would start worshiping at the synagogue and then break off and start a, a Christian church. So Paul himself was not born on Jewish soil, but was raised by Jewish parents in the town of Tarshish, which is north uh, of the Mediterranean around the corner from where Israel is. And uh, so after many generations of people of Israel living in foreign cities and cultures, they tried their best to keep the religion intact, etc. But they struggled to keep those Jewish roots, generation after generation after generation. It's kind of like Christianity. You can raise your kids in church, but that don't mean they're going to stay when they get older. And your grandkids, you can bring them to church, but that don't mean they're going to stay. So generation after generation, if they don't have a first chair experience with Jesus Christ themselves, you're probably going to lose them. They don't need to have religion just because mom has religion and dad has religion. They need to get it for themselves. And I'm talking about religion, but I'm really talking about Christianity. So after many generations of living in foreign cities and cultures, a lot of this they struggle with, and most of them tried to teach the Jewish religion, but most of them got to the point where they no longer were even using the Hebrew language. Why? Because they were in Greek-speaking cities. They did all their work in commerce and school and everything in Greek. And so it got so that the Hebrew language kind of faded out. But Paul, as a Hebrew of the Hebrews, is claiming that he was taught the Hebrew language along with the Jewish religion. This meant that later in life, when he was an adult, he was able to come to Jerusalem and, and sit under the feet of Gamaliel and learn from that Old Testament and speak Hebrew back and forth and learned it directly from one of the most learned teachers of the day. He was also able, when they were out to arrest him and, and the Jewish mob got carried away, he was able to stop and speak to them in their own language. He knew Hebrew. So these four statements mean that Paul was raised in the strictest Jewish traditions and beliefs. He may not have had been born on Jewish soil, but his religious heritage was very strong. He'd stack up with anybody that was even raised in Jerusalem, as far as heritage was concerned. Many of us here could probably claim a, hit, a history, a heritage of Christianity, I've met people who talk about being a third generation Nazarene or so on or whatever, five generations in Methodism or wherever you come from, whatever your background of your ancestors are, and they're, they're proud of that. And uh, we can talk about being raised in the church. We can talk about never missing. I, that's the way I grew up, but you didn't miss. You were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, any United Revival, we were there. I mean, if, if the doors were open, we were there, you had to be sick. Bad sick. I mean, we shared our germs. We coughed in church. We snotted over each other. It was just, you came. 
you came to church. So, and we were happy to share <laughs> our love and the right hand of <laughs> greasy fellowship. So anyway, these, this loyalty that we grew up with is no longer being seen in many churches today. It's still needed. It's harder to find where you attend every time. Uh, just kind of interesting fact, but the average church member attends only, anyway, nine months out of the year. They miss 13 Sundays a year. And that's not good. You need to be with the people of God. Um, you need to be in church. All right, there, there, there's a sermon. Religious heritage, <laughs> but our Christian heritage, so important. But does that Christian upbringing automatically mean that you get saved? No, it does not. And Paul recognized this. He had done all these things, or had been handed to them because of his heritage, but that did not make him a follower of God. Then he added three more items to finish his list of the seven. Paul's religious accomplishments is the next section. Number five, Paul was concerning the law, a Pharisee. As we end up verse five here. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Now the term Pharisee means separated ones, the separated ones. This was an elite Judaism group, never more than 6,000 strong. It kept the, the group limited. They separated themselves. That's why they were the separated ones. They separated themselves from all of common life and common work and task in order to focus on keeping every tiny detail of the Old Testament law and the additional Judaism traditions. Uh, the oral laws, the uh, Talmud, they, it, all of it. I mean, they, they dotted their T's and whoop, crossed their I's. <laughs> they did the, everything they possibly could do. To be Pharisees, to be right, to do it right, to brag about it. Uh, the one guy who's making his prayer, he's saying how he fasted twice every week. And, and you know, and Jesus, he, he hits them because they put on the long faces and the sackcloth. And they made their phylacteries broad. And, and they, they, whatever anybody else did religiously, they went three steps farther. It's kind of like when I was growing up, you could be conservative, but then you could be really conservative. Because the really conservative people, they didn't wear watches because that was jewelry. And, uh, you know, some of them didn't wear ties. Some of them, you know, and the long sleeves and the long dresses and black hose. And, you know, we could go conservative or you could go ultra conservative. And they were there. And some of you that are younger, you have no clue what some of us went through. <laughs> Woo! Thank God for freedom in Christ. Anyway, this the conservative stuff, and that's what he was into. If there was an ultra conservative, if there was the right wing of the right wings, Phariseeism was it. And he went clear to that level. He knew personally what the Jewish religion was like at its most demanding. Yet he didn't find it satisfying spiritually. And number six, moving on to verse six, Paul was concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Now, Paul wasn't just a normal Pharisee. He's telling these people, he went to a deeper level. He became a defender of the Jewish faith. He became a zealous fanatic. He became a radical Pharisee. Even of the Pharisees, he was more radical. He was so devoted to his religion that he was willing to kill those who did not believe the way he believed. It's kind of like some of the Muslims today, right? And we put them kind of in a category. Paul was in that category. If you didn't believe the way he believed, he would kill you. He would arrest you. He would do whatever it took. And to keep the purity of Judaism, he declared war on the new Christian movement that was spreading. He was a persecutor of the church, of Jesus Christ. 
And number seven, the seventh characteristic, Paul said he was concerning the righteousness which is by the law, blameless. Now Paul's highest achievement from his Pharisee background would have been that he had kept all the rules, all the regulations in his religion. Regardless of what it was, he could check it off. I mean, he washed the outside of the cup and the inside of the cup, and he strained out the gnat and you know, swallowed the camel, as Jesus would say. He was meticulous about doing it all. Every bit of it. And remember, this statement is from the perspective of his fanatical past. From the Christian standpoint, Paul would have understood his righteousness score to be completely different. Now in Christ, he realizes, my righteousness is as filthy rags. It is worthless. It didn't do anything for me. But all these things that I did. He could claim what very few claimed, that he was loyal to a fault, that he kept all the rules, he kept all the traditions. He had dotted the I's. And cross the T's, so to speak. There was no black marks on his record of right living. He just did it to the letter. But Paul had a problem. If righteousness in the law was the same as being righteous before God, he had a grand slam home run. Everybody go, woo, go Paul. (laughs) talk about having confidence in the flesh verses 3 and 4 Paul had done it all but were Paul's religious accomplishments enough was his religious heritage enough the third point is Paul's religious bankruptcy We get to verse 7, and Paul wrote, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. I hope I can share so that you can understand the significance of this statement. You see, gain is actually a plural word, gains. Loss is singular. The things, these were gains to me. All of them, they're one loss for Christ. These seven gains that Paul had received by heritage and accomplishment through religious fervor, he now lumped together and he counted as one huge loss since he had met Jesus Christ. See, Paul says, I'm spiritually bankrupt. Everything that I put together, this pedigree, these actions, I even killed people. Put it all together, it equals loss. On the scoreboard of life, I'm at a zero. Religiously, Judaism-wise, I'm at a hundred. But when I met Jesus, I found out I was at a zero. Paul is using commercial transaction terms. Paul, for many years, had placed in the credit scale of his ledger all these advantages of his heritage and the advantages of his accomplishments. And and I have a feeling that he probably reminded God of these things in his prayers. Look, God, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Look, God, I, I was raised in a foreign land, but I learned Hebrew language. Look, God. I went around killing people in your your name. Look, God, you're so privileged to have me. I think he told God that a few times. Because his whole religious life was built on the fact of do this, do this, do this, do this. And be this way. You know, God is so fortunate to have a follower like Paul. And he's so fortunate to have you, isn't he? Because of all the things that you have done. Because of how you've been in the church all these years. And being facetious. Because here's the very problem at the heart of humanity. We've talked about it in membership. 
People are so full of themselves that they fail to see the need to admit that we cannot make it through life without God. We are so full of ourselves today. It's probably worse than any other time. I don't know. Maybe it is. It just seems like it is. That everybody's so self-centered that no relationship will work unless that person is bowing down to them. And they wonder why they struggle with marriages and with their children and with jobs and with everything else in life. Because it's supposed to be all about me and I'm the center of the universe and everything revolves around me. And they all go, oh, how great you are, how great you are, yes, how great you are. And all of a sudden you marry somebody who says, how great I am, how great I am. And you're going, well, what's going on here? It works for a while. This is the problem of the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, fill the commandments. And he says, I've kept these for my youth. And Jesus says, well, sell what you have, come and follow me. And he went away sorrowful. Because all he wanted was everybody to tell him how great he was, how great he was, how great he was. And Jesus said, follow me. Have a relationship with Jesus. And I don't want that. This is the heart of the problem. And so here's Paul. He could brag about all the stuff that he did. And he's on the way and he's going to Damascus and he's riding his horse and leading the troops. And they're going to create more chaos and Jesus shows up. It's all about Paul one second. And the next second, God knocks him down off his high horse. He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And Paul realized that all of his spiritual attainments and he could list them, and he told God about him, and he told everybody else about him. Now it equaled zero because he had met Jesus. He had met Jesus Christ. And everything he claimed as his own righteousness, I'm blameless in righteousness, I've done everything right, it was now only worthlessness, a loss, a huge zero. He was bankrupt spiritually. Because he had met Jesus Christ. Paul's problem was not that he didn't pass the religious test. He passed the religious test in flying colors. But when he found out that he had taken the wrong test. See, it's not a religious test. It's a Jesus test. It's not about all the things that I do and don't do. It's about the things that Jesus does. And somewhere we forget that Jesus is the one that makes all this possible. He's the one that died on the cross. He's the one that lived the life of sinlessness. He's the one who rose again from the grave. He's the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. He's the one praying for us right now. He's the one that cares, and he's building a home for us. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. In all my efforts, Paul said, zero. All your efforts, zero. Becoming a follower of God is zero unless we have Jesus. <laughs> In fact, as he tried to pass the religious test of his day, in actuality, Paul learned that Jesus died to pass the test for him. The only way we pass the test of Christianity is through Jesus. Jesus scored 100 in Paul's place. He scored 100 in your place, too. If you will just sign your name, you can pass Christianity 101 with 100% because it's through Jesus Christ. So do you understand? Paul before Christ was Saul. And Saul had racial prejudice. Saul was an elitist. Saul had an orthodoxy in belief. He had zeal in his actions. He was self-righteous in his attitude. And Saul was wrong in so many ways. And then he met Jesus Christ. And Jesus turned his world upside down. 
His name became Paul. Legalism was replaced by a relationship. Uh, Judaism was replaced by Christianity. Murder was replaced by missionary evangelism and church building. What a change. Radical change. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. There's a great change since I've been born. (laughs) Change. Now, Paul did not condemn Judaism. It had brought him a long way. It was the foundation for what he was able to do in writing all this stuff. And we're just grateful for it. But Paul discovered the answer to Judaism when he met Jesus Christ. Because the Judaism people are still looking for the Messiah. And Jesus came 2,000 years ago. They don't have to look anymore for the Messiah. He came. And Paul had to realize he came. And when he realized he came, he became a Christian. He became a follower of Jesus. Jesus. Instead of a follower of Judaism. You see, the Jews were looking and longing for the Messiah, but they missed the turn. The turn in the road came at the cross when Jesus died for us. And everybody kept missing the turn and kept missing the turn. They just kept trucking down this path. Paul missed the turn until Jesus came and knocked him down and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then Paul made the turn and followed Jesus. No longer focused on being religious, Paul's new focus was growing in his relationship with Jesus. This was a totally different Paul. And we're going to be studying about it in the sermons to come. As, as you look at what Paul wrote, he said, These things that were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not by having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is found in faith in Christ, righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, and so on. Oh, I just love this. And not that I've already attained or already perfected, I press on that I may lay hold for that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Why did God grab Paul? <laughs> now what is Paul grabbing after? Brother, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's my life, Paul said. It's a different Paul. List all these things. Zero. Zero. And now my life is knowing and following Jesus. I hope you get that. I'm not saying we're not to do right things. I'm saying we are to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will do right things. But focus on the relationship more than the do's and don'ts. You and I know people who can do the do's and don'ts. Like the rich young ruler, they say, I've kept all that from my youth up. But do they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Come on, folks. And then we wonder sometimes why we lose our kids and grandkids, because they don't see a relationship, they see the do's and don'ts. You've got to have Jesus. You've got to have his love. You've got to have his um, enablement, his power. It's not enough to have your name on a church roll. You need Jesus Christ. Every day you need Jesus Christ. Alive and well in your life. If I can't get that across, I'm failing. Because that's what Paul is saying. 
I'm spiritually bankrupt until I have a relationship with Jesus. And then he begins to give blessings and grace and mercy and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and holiness and on and on and on. He giveth and giveth and giveth again. Paul was teaching the Philippians and us that Christianity is not just another religion. Being raised in a religious family, doing religious things. No, Christianity is really about having a personal, real relationship with Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. And have you been putting your confidence in religious heritage? You've been putting your accomplishments in your religious accomplishments? It's time to realize that all you have is a religious bankruptcy, because that's just religion. It's time to put yourself at the foot of the cross and recognize that the only way to be saved is surrendering to Jesus Christ. I surrender all. And today, I'm happy to tell you, you can have a real relationship with Jesus. Where he becomes your Savior, your Lord, and your best friend. And he'll be there for you. We have family altar time here at our church. The family of God. Come and pray at the altar. That's what it's about. Anybody that wants to come and pray can do so. As the praise team gets ready, I'm going to say a short prayer. We'll open the altar, bring whatever needs you have to the Lord, and uh, talk to him about all these things and anything else in your life that you would. Lord, we just thank you for this time of prayer, talking to Jesus, sharing with each other, and uh, we pray that all of us will just feel comfortable Sharing with Jesus our innermost needs and problems and faults today. Help us to realize that it's all about him. It's not about us. Come Holy Spirit, speak to us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Mind the Lord. Trust what you say, that you're
Let's continue in prayer. Lord, we just thank you that we have this time to share together right now, to talk to you about all the stuff in our life. (laughs) You know about it, Lord. You know the things that are holding us back. You know, Lord, the things that we would hang on to. And Paul said it's all those gains are just loss. When it comes to Jesus Christ, I want Jesus. And when I have him, I have everything else. So, Lord, today we just pray that you'll give us Jesus. (laughs) Give us Jesus. Give us more of Jesus. Lord, help us to seek after you with a whole heart. Help us to long for you. Help us to love you. Help us to, to, to do our best to just be Jesus. And, Lord, allow you to flow through us. Help these that are praying, and Lord, we just pray that you just guide them through whatever their issues are to give them to Jesus, to let him have it, because you, God, can take it, and you can remove it, and you can help us to grow and walk in you, be in our financials, in our relationships, in our, in our decisions, Lord, in our work environment, in our families, and, and all the responsibilities that we have. But Lord, we just bring all of it to you and give it to you today, because you are God, And you, Lord, want to change us and make us a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then, Lord, you want to uh, totally work through our lives to make things different in every aspect of our life. Lord, you can redeem. You can restore. You can renew. And you can help us to start fresh. That's the kind of God you are. Every day, Lord, we give ourselves to you, and every day, Lord, you start out again using us, making a difference in us. And when we fail, we come to you and say, Lord, we're sorry, and you pick us up and we go on again. Lord, you are that kind of God. Meet the needs of those that are praying here today. Meet the needs of those we are praying for today. You know there's so many of them. Thank you, Jesus. We love you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When peace like a river
God is good. All the time, He is good. Amen. We're going to take our tithes and offerings, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord. We have some announcements. I'm going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to have VBS stuff, and on and on it goes, and we're going to work for the Lord all week. It'd be good if you'd come back tired next Sunday. That'd be really good. <laughs> we will, yes. <laughs> Those that work during VBS. All right. So let's pray. Lord, we pray that you'll bless the offering, and Lord, we just pray that you use it for your honor and your glory today and for the building of the church, and Lord, some of the money goes to missions too, and we just pray that you will uh, help us as we give, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon. If you're looking for a church in the Brazil, Indiana area, the Brazil Church of the Nazarene invites you to join us as we seek him, celebrate him, and serve him. Sunday morning, we have Sunday school at 9 a.m. and worship at 10 a.m. During worship, we have We Worship for preschool age kids and a children's church for elementary age kids. For this information, news, a schedule of events, and more, please visit us online at brazilnaz.com. That's B R A Z I L N A Z.com. Or visit us in person at 1002 East National Avenue in Brazil. Thank you and God bless.